Hello, AGA's allies and caregivers who are listening to our podcast, The Rare Advocates, a caregiver-worthy and rare disease podcast brought to you by a Cardi Gutierrez Syndrome Advocacy Association, where we update you with the latest news and conversations around Cardi Gutierrez and rare diseases. My name is Betty, producer and marketing director, so you all know me by now. And most importantly, I'm a mom of two little ones, the youngest one, Noah, diagnosed with a Cardi Gutierrez. The stories you're about to hear are close to my heart, and I hope they help you as much as they have helped me. And don't forget to join the conversation. We are now on all social media platforms, so be sure to subscribe and leave a review to our podcast wherever you're listening to us from. We're thankful you're here, and we hope we can help you in this journey. In today's episode, we have James, who will be sharing the story of his daughter, May. May was diagnosed with a cardiac uterus right before the pandemic. We will talk about the diagnosis, treatment obstacles, and present state. So now I'm going to go ahead and bring James to the screen. Hi, James. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. And you're joining us from California, correct? That's right. Southern California. Tell me who is affected by a cardiac uterus syndrome in your family. My daughter, uh, she is currently four years old. And she was uh, diagnosed when she was about 11 months old. Oh, wow. 11 months old. Um, So why did you suspect that your daughter had something wrong? Um, When she was born, everything seemed totally normal. Um, In the hospital, right away, she had some trouble nursing. You know, it was really hard to nurse. We had to use a lot of bottle and a lot of syringe and all these different things. Nursing was like a really tough thing. Time went on. She she was developing pretty normally, like maybe just a little bit slower than than some other kids as far as like movement. She seemed totally fine. We did take her in for PT for a while because she was crawling and everything, but she had a hard time. Like one of her arms was like a little bit having a hard time. So we would do some PT there. I guess yeah. when she was 11 months old, she got a, a vaccine. And then right after that, she got a cold. What we think happened is like both of those things triggered her immune system like pretty strongly. And it, it triggered the um, the AGS into like a really big flare. And that was like really when the onset happened. You, let's just talk a little bit more. You said something was wrong with her arm. Was it like stiffness that she had going on? It was stiff. And it seemed like uh, when you when we would watch other kids crawl and then watch her crawl, she wasn't as fast. She was slower. It was as if it was like a little sluggish. Like it felt like all her limbs were stiffer. Exactly. And then her left arm particularly was like, she would some kind of like pull it away a little bit. Like she didn't want to put as much weight on that arm sometimes. She turned 11 months old, got her, I'm assuming routine, routinely vaccines. And then mm-hmm. that's when things started surfacing even, even more. Yeah, it was really scary because literally within about four hours after that vaccine, she, she lost all expression on her face. Um, she was very... Like almost like a numb expression. Like she's usually a really happy and really energetic kid. And uh, she would go, she went very kind of numb personality. She didn't want to crawl very much. She started slowing down her movement like right away, like right away. Something was, something was immediately different. And my wife was like really panicking. She started to just like plummet from there. You know, she got a cold and then even after the cold, um, post-infection from the cold, she continued to get even more um, problems movement. So she went from being like a kid who was crawling around. She was just about to walk. Like she was just going to learn how to walk. Um, she hadn't done any talking yet, but she was she was making a lot of like noises and uh, super happy, uh, just learning to walk. And then when this all happened, when the onset happened, this was like uh, November 2019. Um, it took a, a two or three weeks of just, com- you know, steady decline to the point where she didn't want to crawl at all. She didn't want to stand up. Her legs were shaky. Um, It looked, she was extremely irritable. You know, it looked as if everything was painful. Every every time she wanted to put weight on her arms, it was very, it seemed very painful. Um, We could tell that she probably had like headaches. She was um, in the worst mood almost all the time. You know, she was really, really uncomfortable. We couldn't tell what it was. We were, we were, we had flown over to Virginia to see the family at the time. And so we went to the first hospital over there to get her checked out. 
one of the people at the walk-in clinic said, you better get a full neurological workup on her. I think it's neurological. You better get checked out. So we went to the ER and they completely blew us off. They thought that we were abusing her and they thought that she had like hand a nursemaid's elbow. Like we had pulled her arms too hard because she, she was complaining about her left arm just wouldn't even move at the time. So they thought we were abusing her. We were stuck in the ER with like no interaction with anyone for like 13 hours, something like that. We went home with like nowhere closer. It wasn't until we like came back to um, California to our local hospital, which is Children's Hospital of Orange County, where they did a full, over two hospital visits, they did a full workup. And they started ruling things out one after another. Like they thought it was like a mito disease at one point. They thought it was cerebral palsy for a while. And then they were like, well, we really don't know. We're going to be honest. We still don't know what it is. So then they then they started the genetic testing. Complete panic mode from parents because we know it's getting worse. And then when the doctors have no idea, it makes you more threatened. You know, you, you feel even more lost because you have no idea like what's going on. And she hasn't stopped declining. And you're wondering, well, is this permanent? Like, is she going to come out of this? We sent out for, we did the genetic test. Where does this put us right now? After those two full workups at the hospital, you know, how old is she at this time? How many months or? Yeah, so we, she was, um, the onset was when she was on a let, no, November 2019. She was 11 months old. So then in December, the very beginning, like middle of December is when we did all the workups. Okay. Well, we did all the workups around middle, mid December. Like even before the holiday, before like Christmas and New Year's, and so that that was it took about a month, you know, to get to go through all these different hospitals and get the full workup, and um, back and forth, in and out. You know, they had sent us home a couple times because like they were like really we really don't know if she still has problems. Bring her back. Um, so that was like mid December, 2019. To an extent, pre pandemic, so things are about to get really busy and you're still trying to figure out what's wrong. So when does the genetic testing happen? Genetic testing happens around, I think we did it in December, I believe. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So we did that. They finally jumped into it. Yeah. They jumped into it around, around, yeah, I think near the end of December, we were able to do it. And we actually did two of them. We did, we did one later as, as almost like a safety because they said they could get it done really fast. And, and our hospital was telling us it's going to take you, you know, three to six months to do the test. And we thought that's a long time when she's suffering. Now we know, we know there was some sort of like inflammation or some infection or something going on right now. So when did you receive the news? So March 6, we were driving down to San Diego because she was still like having problems nursing and everything. And so we had, we had thought like a couple times we had given her um, treatment for tongue tie and lip tie because it, it did seem to help a little bit, you know, they were really pushing us. Oh, she's tongue tied. She is lip tied. That's what it is. That's why she's having trouble nursing, you know? So we were on the way there. We were driving on the way there and that one of the geneticists called us on the phone and they said it's Icardi Gutierrez syndrome. and um, I immediately started like looking it up and she had really, she had no idea what it was. Um, they had been, we had been talking about mito diseases, like different mito diseases. I had already started like talking to other, other mito parents about things. Um, we thought that's where the direction was headed. And so they told us over the phone, I'll never, I'll never forget what we were doing and where we were going and the weather and the mood that was there, you know, it was, it wasn't scary yet. It was just like really powerful. It was such a powerful moment to like hear a diagnosis. They were completely confident. That's what it was. And then we had to go, we go do our appointment the whole time we're in our appointment. We're thinking about it. I'm looking at it up online and immediately I read that it's like a severe neurological condition. So my hands are like shaking. I'm like, this is, this is, this is, this is as bad as we thought it was. We, you had a feeling it was something severe. There's so many levels of severity there. So we're like, oh, let's just hope that it's not as severe for her. You know, that's all we could do. Yeah. I actually remember those exact same questions that you have and thoughts that I had. I just said, oh, please let it be the late 
like the late onset, less severe, you 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 still have some hope, even though you're hearing the worst news you can prepare yourself for. So mm-hmm. how did that make you guys feel? We we had a job to do to go to the appointment and get lip tie and tongue tie done and tie done and it was it was it's really painful so she was crying and we were just focused on her and everything but the whole time there the whole ride back we were just my I think my wife was in kind of shock as far as like she didn't really know what to think of it yet and my brain was already just like I couldn't read enough couldn't read fast enough I wanted to know all about it I wanted to know everything I could about it to like know really what we're in for. And I would read that article over and over again. I think I actually was reading like the Philadelphia, the CHOP article, the CHOP description. That was the first thing I happened to find. No one at our local hospital had any, there were no patients there. They had maybe one patient like 30 years ago that had AGS. So nobody locally could help us. We we It was that feeling of like, why did why did this happen to us that we have such a rare condition that no one knows no one knows about it like where do we go now mm-hmm. like if no one no one locally knows about it this is like a really big city pretty quickly we found Philadelphia you know pretty quickly doing some research we were like all right Philadelphia is like they they know what they're doing there let's let's talk to them right now yeah how how did you go about did you meet with them virtually um because you told them that your geneticist didn't even know about it so how did you proceed from hearing the diagnosis to contacting chop pretty quickly we scheduled an appointment with dr vandiver and it was telehealth because um we got the diagnosis on march 6 and then march 15th like just a few days later we went into complete lockdown everything started going into lockdown so we we contacted Dr. Vanderver and the team there just in time for them to close the clinical trial, right? So we we learned pretty quickly. Um, we had an appointment with Dr. Vanderver and she started talking about baricitinib during that appointment. She was amazing. We talked to so many people during that appointment. We learned right away she recommended trying to get on this medicine. And she said, I'm sorry, our clinical trial is closed. Like they're only going to continue the trial for people that are already on it. But she said, you're kind of on your own in, in, um, in, in getting bears, sight in them. So we thought, great. Okay. This is one obstacle after another, but we'll figure it out. This is June 11th, 2020. We had a telehealth appointment with Dr. Vandiver. Um, and we had to work out telehealth at the time. By then they were, they were okay doing telehealth because it was like, they, before then, they they would have these rules. California has these rules. You have to be a, a licensed California doctor to do health, telehealth. But they were willing to like drop that during this part of COVID. We did the telehealth, but the night before the telehealth appointment, May got like a really bad stomach virus, and she threw up all over the bed. You know, like she it was, she was super sick, the most sick she's ever been. And then we had the telehealth appointment, and then. Um, Dr. Vandiver went through a full breakdown, gave a really good explanation about AGS-6, because May has a type 6, about what that means and everything. I really encourage you to try to get this medicine. I think it's going to help you. Um, And so that illness that May got like the night before sent her into like an extremely bad flare-up, like a really bad flare-up. So then then we learned like we really have to watch out. This, This condition is all about, you know, watching what happens when you get sick. It turns out May, like some kids get flare ups and they, they're they OK afterwards, but May gets flare ups and she suffers like serious, serious regressions. Like she gets affected by flare ups like big time. The stomach virus was strong enough to push her immune system overboard. We went to the hospital and what we did is we knew about baricitinib. We knew I've been, and, I, and at this time I had just started talking to Patrick Winters, too. I just started talking to Patrick. I found I had found the Facebook group somewhere around near this time and immediately got a hold of him. We texted each other a few times and we did a phone call or two. Let me help the audience, right? Because those who don't have someone close that sold them all the things that we're talking about, they're going to be a little bit lost. So we have a Facebook group where we're on uh, LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, but this um, and Instagram. 
but this Facebook group, it's very helpful for those parents and direct caregivers. There's nine different types that, you know, there's a wide spectrum. So at least we're kind of like there for each other and we're helping each other probably a little bit more than sometimes doctors because doctors haven't seen that many cases. Mm -hmm. So it's a good way for us to just uh, check in and see how others are dealing with the situations that we're dealing with. So you found Patrick, who's part of the group, and then here, what happened here? Yeah, Patrick's very active in the group, and, he, and he's extremely helpful, especially to like new people. So he saw me get on the group and start talking and um, introduced himself. We started talking offline, and he just was like checking in. He was like, how are you doing? What's going on? How far have you gotten in this in this situation? Because like every family almost has to go through the same type of things. I'm sure every family feels just as lost as we did. So it's a lot of information to find out from from nothing, you know. So the the, the Facebook group was tremendously useful. Um, like you said, they, there's so much information that you get that the doctors w wouldn't be able to tell you. Like even Philadelphia doctors wouldn't always be able to tell you. Talk to him. He gave me a really good insight on like what the disease was like and kind of what to expect. And he he himself also said, I really think you should try to get her on this medicine. You know, I really think you should try to get this medicine because it helped his his kid a lot. Um, and he he wanted to see that with other families. He was like, this is the first thing you should do. So now tell me, how how did you access it? Because now you know, like, okay, I have to get, him, get her on this medication, but how do you get it in the middle of the pandemic? How'd you handle that? That was, that was just as stressful as getting a diagnosis. You know, all of this, I, I feel like getting the medicine um, was as stressful or more stressful than, than dealing with a child that's like suffering so much. It was really hard for us, um, but, I, but I had a lot of help. You know, we couldn't, I couldn't have done it without a bunch of help. So what we did is we, we used that hospital stay when, when we, when she was really sick in June, right during that um, telehealth visit with Dr. Vandiver, we w went into the hospital soon after that. And I used that visit to push the doctors to help us prescribe this medicine. And so what, what we did was I, I got some information from Patrick, like some really good letters, you know, that he had, he had also used to talk to the doctors. And I readapted some of those letters for our, our situation. I researched all the different doctors and heads of the department at the hospital. And I just started emailing, emailing them. And I had to, I didn't know their email. So I had to guess their email addresses wow. based on like first letter, last name. This is, you know, this doctor is the head of neurology, email them, head of neurology. I'm going to email them. And this long, very, passionate letter about this is what's happening to our daughter. Um, we know we've done the research. I had, by this time I'd been reading like every research paper I could get my hands on um, going to like the Russian websites where you have to illegally download the, the PubMed papers and everything like trying to get these papers. To convince them to prescribe and take you in as a, yeah. take your daughter in as a patient and to prescribe the jack inhibitors, right? Yeah. While we were in the hospital. I was doing okay, this all okay. very quickly while we were there. So um, I would be at the hospital talking to the doctors all day with May and they're doing IVs and doing all this stuff with her. And then my wife would come do the night shift. Um, and then at night I would be writing emails and sending all the emails out. And then I did this very quickly, emailed all these department heads. And then one day the, um, the head of rheumatology comes in to the, the, to, to May's room, Dr. Shulman, he's the head of rheumatology. He comes in and he says, hey, I got your message and I have a little bit of experience with this before because I I was in, I know the paper, I know the Candle Savi paper that was in like, I don't know, like the 70s or 80s, I think, which had, um, it's really similar to AGS. Some of those, some of those kids in that study were really similar to AGS. So he studied that one and he had some kids, he had a patient that had like a candle. He said, I know a little bit about what's going on here. I'd like to help. You know, I think, I think you're right. I think it's probably a good idea to prescribe this medicine. I, I did some reading and like, I'd like to help you. And I was like, oh my God, I almost like started crying like right there when, when he told me that. And so he was a really nice guy, him, him. And then our neurologist got together 
and the the neurology team actually got together the prior authorization, the prescription, and everything, and sent it to our our pharmacy, which was CVS, to get prescribed. So first step done. I got the doctors on board. They agreed that they thought this would be like a good thing to do. But it, I, I had to use the hospital visit of my my daughter going through a flare to show them and to show the other like. 50 so other doctors that came to see her to convince them look this is what's going on she can't use her hands she can't use her arms sure her head is like completely tilted over to one side you know like this this did this wasn't like this um, you know before um yeah, and, it, and it's so scary because i'm sure you went through a similar situation where you have videos to show them mm -hmm. how it progressed and it's also really sad for us parents to relive that and continue to retell the story over and over and over again and don't leave any details out because you want the doctors to truly have an idea of what's going on because you watch your daughter with your wife every single day. The doctors on board, the prescription, but now it's actually acquiring the the body, the jack inhibitor. So how, how did that go? And getting insurance involved as well. Yeah, that was the worst part because I knew we really needed it. I knew we really needed the medicine and we should start taking it right away. And we thought maybe it could have like an immediate effect. And so CVS immediately denied it. Um, but then they went into like a, an appeal after that. But my line of thinking was like, no, I'm going to get it now and I'm going to get her to start taking it now. So while CVS was going into the appeal process, CVS is like talking to a robot, by the way, too. Like you never really talk to any humans most of the time. It's like uh, the recording after recording after recording. It's really hard to get through. And their their whole thing was like, well, this is this is a medicine for adults for rheumatoid arthritis. It's not in our, this is off label. This is not in our, we've never had this done before. They They just went by the book. And then the hospital said though, the hospital said, hey, we've done off label prescriptions before. I think we can still get this through. It's just going to take some time. And I was like, all right, do your best. And then I said, I'm going to go. CVS won $7,000 for, for a month supply for, for the med. And, I, and then so I, I had heard about Kroger because I had heard about some other families getting it from Kroger. So I called Kroger and the, Kroger was amazing. Kroger was way cheaper. Kroger was $4,000 for two months. And everyone I talked to, I talked to humans. And everyone I talked to was extremely nice and helpful. And um, so I bought two months supply for $4,000 from Kroger first, knowing that I, even if I did get something from CVS, they probably wouldn't even re reimburse me. I had already figured out the relationship with CVS was going to be rough. Everyone, you know, because the people I did talk to, it was, it was rough. It was a rough conversation. They were just like very cold and very huge corporate, very difficult to get through to them, you know. But Kroger was like, uh, they wanted nothing to help, but to help us. They were like, of course, we're going to give it to you and we're going to give it to you as cheap as we can. Kroger actually started helping us getting, getting approval through CVS. Oh, I wow. told them my story and they actually helped. They hadn't, they, they knew that once we got CVS that I would no longer be going to Kroger, but they wow. still wanted to help us. And once we finally did get CVS approval, uh, Kroger's the one who called me and said, Hey, we got it. We got it for you. We helped to get it for you. We got, and then I started crying on the phone. I was just I was like, no way. This is unbelievable. So it was because of like all these letters from Patrick and, and having someone to talk to like Patrick, Dr. Vandiver, um, my wife's support, um, Kroger, and then the doctors at our local hospital, Children's Hospital Orange County, that were able to, you know, push really hard to, to get it through. I feel like I'm watching it right now. I want to cry when I, you heard and you said you got <laughs> it prescribed. But this is Kroger, like the grocery store? Yeah. My insurance company is like a Aetna, kind of like Blue Shield yeah. type of insurance. Yes. But the pharmacy part of it is all covered by CVS Pharmacy. Here's the thing for those who are listening, you know, when we're making these phone calls, you know, we're being brief. Obviously, we're trying to get straight to the point or telling them, you know, rare disease, which 
should be a common term like okay you know a rare disease should be like a trigger for the person but when we tell them it's like progressive and they need it and then doctors are prescribing it it gets really frustrating to be like what don't you understand this is a kid I'm the parent of course I'm you know going through every single step and I I need this medication and for them just to say well it's it's not what it's for and not listen to everything we say previously. It's so oh, frustrating. And then yeah. when we do talk to someone, um, I have a, another pharmacy for another medication called Panther RX and it talks and it's just with rare diseases. It's day and night, day and night Whoa. because they, they are used to dealing with families and caregivers with just rare diseases. They might not know every rare disease, which makes sense. You know, there's, hundred thousands actually but the fact you know that they take a second to listen they follow up hey you're about to run out what do you need how can we help do they at least this is the treatment i get with the other one they're like hey do you have enough for this weekend no we're gonna ship it after overnight that is just such a huge difference for us so Whoa, the fact that amazing, the pharmacy yeah. yes but the, the fact that the other pharmacy helped you and said hey we got it and called you and let you know the news. I mean, that's that's amazing. They're great. They're they're. I love them. They. I wish I could go through them. You know, I wish that I could use that pharmacy because I they, I would give them my business if I could. You know. Does this mean that the insurance approved it as well? And now you were about to get it. This is what month? So it took about a month or like a month or two to go through the denial. Um, so I I had sent in like a stack of medical papers to my neurologist and all these and on a big letter that was like, all right, here's the here's what we give the medical reviewers at CVS. Boom, here, take this. And they had put their own articles in too and written their own letters. So it took a long time to assemble all that stuff, which um Patrick had already done like a lot of that. So I just like added on whatever else I could find. Um and so I it was super helpful to have his letter, you know, and, and the, those medical papers that that was really handy because it made it a lot faster and it did help us get, get, finally get through to them. Um, it took a couple months and we finally got it, but as soon as we got it, we realized, Oh wait, this expires in a year. This prescription expires in a year. So we have, we have to go through the, the whole thing over again every year. Now, after a year went by of taking the medicine, we had to go through, through it again and it got even worse it got I, the approval process got even harder the next year it was crazy it was as if they knew we went through all this work to prescribe it the first time and when you're talking to them you're saying look yeah my daughter this is like a life-saving medication this might add years to their life they have a fatally progressive disease and there's there's no cure this is the only intervention that anyone in the medical field knows about this is the only intervention that is known. And yes, it's off label. We're asking you to do a lot. It's expensive, but this is it. The next year that they had denied it immediately again. And it was as if this, this ask had come onto a brand new person's desk. You know, they didn't take into account any history. Like there was no one single point of contact. Um, in order to get to talk to someone, it would take up almost like two hours on the phone to even get to talk to someone. It was so frustrating that, uh, I would just be red in the face, like angry, just because I couldn't get through to people. I couldn't get through the phone system. They'd hang up on me. They would get the order information wrong. And they were really stubborn about the appeal. They, they denied the appeal too this time. And we had already started running out of, out of meds. We ran out of meds. We were about to run out of meds. And I thought, oh my gosh. Um, so I ended up buying more meds out of pocket. And this time I bought meds out of pocket from, from, um, CVS, because they said they might be able to reimburse some of it. So I had to buy like another two months supply. And this time it was $20,000 for two, for two months, 20, 20 grand. And that was after I had gotten someone on the phone and pushed and pushed and pushed for a discount. That was almost like a 50 or 40% discount from what they were offering is what I got. And Maybe. the only reason we got the second um, approval was because it went peer to peer by then. Denial, appeal denied. Then it goes doctor peer to peer, like a CVS doctor to our doctor, our our neurologist. So our, our neurologist somehow got on the phone with the CVS doctor, 
Luckily, the CVS doctor had heard of or met Dr. Vanderburg before and knew what she was up to, understood what this disease was already, had a little bit of an understanding because they, they had a relationship with Dr. Vanderburg, like a small one. And so they were like, okay. So they, they approved it the second time. Let me ask you this question. So she had been on the medication for about a year, right? Because yeah. um, she had been taking body. Now my question is, what were the signs or the things that you saw and your wife saw on your daughter, May, that showed that the medication was helping? But immediately her mood changed. She was not um, as irritable. And it seemed like she was no longer in pain. And it seemed like um, immediately she also started getting like a, a big appetite. You know, her appetite got really good. Um, and she was eating everything all over the house. And her mood improved. It didn't seem like she had as bad headaches. The, her joint pain and everything seemed better. She was happy. She was really happy. And over time, we couldn't tell right away, but over time it seemed like she was leveled out. There was less activity going on because up until this point, she would go in and out of flares even if she was sick or not. She would kind of, you know, have good days and bad days that were really erratic, you know? Yeah. But when she's on the medicine, it seemed to like level everything out and it seemed to like be giving her some sort of base level of like normalcy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, she, uh, I thought about it the other day. It's like almost they're like, they're still sick. They're just a less miserable baby. Yeah. And it sounds yeah. like, uh, it, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot, especially coming mm -hmm. from when they're, you know, irritable, you see the stiffness. My, my son also, it looked like he was getting migraines and he was in so much pain and he just like, he didn't want to be outside and he was just uncomfortable the whole entire time. And they were mm -hmm. like, oh, but you got the medication. He's all better. And I'm like, I mean, now we mm -hmm. can kind of like live day by day, but you know, he still has other problems. That's the unfortunate thing about um, AGS. It comes with its complication and each type has more common complications according to the type, but it makes a huge difference to us that they're not crying all the time, right? And like you said, yeah. that May can actually, you know, eat and has an appetite. It was, at least we had like a year of use to say, hey, this is working. This is doing some good. You know, we had that with us and we had to prove to all the doctors um, to still be on, on board with us to like want to continue prescribing it, that like it's working. She's not getting any worse. Like it does seem to be protecting her. We're in, I have to say, we're in 2023 and she started taking it in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, late summer, early fall 2020. So it's almost been uh, a little over two years since she's been taking it. So compare, tell me a little bit more about her present state. How is she doing now? It feels like she has been able to grow a lot. She's gotten a lot bigger. She has, it still seems to like level her out, except for when she gets sick from certain viruses, it can't fully protect her. She still has to get hospitalized and get um, prednisone. She, what we've been doing is if she gets really sick and gets a bad neurological flare up, we will go in for about and get like a five day course of steroids. And that seems to like stop that to keep that from going down. Um, and she's gotten so much better. She went into the hospital last November and they gave her IV. She didn't even cry. She knew, she knows all the people. We've been there hospitalized so many times there. She knows everyone. Like she had a, she had a great time. She was like, oh, it's like a hotel stay, you know? So whereas the first time was completely traumatic. Yeah. Like whereas she, she was screaming the entire time. She didn't know what was going on. She was freaking out. We had to hold her like this and walk around the entire night to get her any sleep. Um, she wouldn't lay down. She was too scared to be away from us. Whereas now she's got all this confidence. She knows what's going on. She knows when we need to get blood tests. She knows what's happening. Um, it's a, I feel like it's allowed her to get better with and given her like enough time and energy to like get better with her speech computer and um, her personality has really come out. Like she's super aware. She knows what everyone is saying. She, she understands Japanese and English. Um, 
she Very has improved. <laughs> She's a really smart kid. She's super smart. She's just so alert. And um, some of her therapies have like really improved. They still kind of go up and down, but like she's able to do a lot. You know, I, I feel like she's 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 very capable. If we're helping her, she can she can do a lot of things. She can yeah. still play with her hands. She likes to stand up with help. She likes to try to you know she likes to walk around with help. Um, gate trainer with us with what's holding her. So like she's got a life. You know she like she has a really great life. Um, yeah. We just have to we have this like. Our thing is we just go to the hospital when she gets a bad flare up. We know right away, we call them, they try to get us a bed so we don't have to go through the ER and we just stay there for like almost a week and get her checked out and get her get her help. Yeah. I almost feel like, you know, as you're describing things, I almost feel like the jack inhibitors are like um like a float, like a like a boat that we give our kids because they're still in, in like a sea of illnesses and sickness mm -hmm. and the jack inhibitors allows them just to breathe every day but they're still mm -hmm. surrounded by all this illness and kind of like the flares like are the waves you know and they, they still get them I mean they get splashed and you know that's when we have to take them into the hospital and get them extra medication so they can breathe and take a rest but if it wasn't for the jack inhibitors, I feel like they would not be able to float and they would just be sinking every day. And mm -hmm. the fact that I hear how smart and bubbly and cool May is, it makes me really happy because my baby is, is just one year old. And um, mm -hmm. it's it's scary to think about the future, as, as you know. Um, you know, I'm thankful that we have the jack inhibitors and I'm hopeful that we'll get them I'm sure like you think like every month because they they cannot afford to not take them. It's like yeah. taking their boat away and they're going to be prone to getting a whole lot worse, a lot faster and immediately, like you said, begin to cry and feel uncomfortable and feel pain. So if you could give any advice to parents or caregivers who just heard the news that their kid was diagnose what advice would you give them get as find the community find find your community first like whether it's going to be one of the social media websites get get to know some of the people don't don't be afraid to tell your story uh, we were afraid to tell the story in the beginning you know even our family and friends we didn't we did it we didn't feel comfortable it was so hard to even talk about that we didn't even feel ta comfortable talking about it in the beginning so I encourage people to talk over their story be try to try to tell it because you'll you need to reach out for help you really need to get as much help as possible you know some kind of a support community um try to get on the medicine you can doing a clinical trial or trying to get it like we did um and get connected with philadelphia and for us after a couple of years it went from being completely scary to being you know, pretty good. You know, it feels like everything is so much less scary now. It feels like we have finally settled in, you know, um, at least with the medical part, you know, that that's totally settled in. It's like, it's a known quantity. You know, I feel like that read, read the medical papers as much as you can to understand what's going on. Um, there was one from like last year, that was a really good one that that was recent has a, like a lot of really recent good information read as much as you can find out as understand as much as you can uh yeah. po and post your problems on on social media and I, every time we have something that we don't know about we've always found really good answers on on like the facebook group somebody has been through it already i completely agree it's uh it's nice to have support and parents that are not afraid to be like well try this try this this was what worked and it kind of like narrows down your options and mm -hmm. that way you can brainstorm with doctors and tackle the problem a whole lot faster and like you said it's maybe less scary within the scary because you have more information right mm -hmm. the power of information um and as a new a new parent he, talking to parents who are a year or two ahead of us, it's 
it's nice. It's nice to hear. I mean, my word of choice is confidence. <laughs> it's nice yeah. to hear that because yeah. it, it's so scary. What advice do you have to give to those who are medical professionals, whether, again, they work at CVS, Kroger, mm -hmm. whatever, wherever they may work? What advice do you have to give to them when dealing with AGS families and caregivers? I would say please just try to listen to the parents and try to have some compassion for their story because one of the parents explaining what the situation is, there's no way you'll be able to fully understand what it's like to be an AGS parent unless you are one. So it's very difficult to describe to people what it's like. There's so many aspects to it. So listen carefully and listen closely and, and just try to be kind, you know, because there's, the, the our kids are the ones that are suffering the most and we're just trying to do something good for them and so working working through the professionals to try to get an understanding takes a lot it's a lot to ask for someone to understand something when they might not have any special needs kids or they may not have they don't have a kid that has AGS so how do we convey that to them just like please listen you know try to try to listen it's very hard because when we decide to share something, we really hope we're being listened to because we don't we don't tell them everything. So when we decide to say something, we really try to choose our words carefully and you know, we're advocating for our kids. That's what we're doing, like you said. Um, so my very last question to you is, if May were to listen to this podcast or your wife were to listen to this podcast or maybe a close friend, family or friend that has helped you guys during this journey, what would you like to say to them? Oh, I would probably tell my wife that she has been the best support. We've had to do this together and somehow we've stayed together and we've shared the work and we've shared the the burden that this creates on the family and nobody else understands my, our, our kid more than my wife does like my kid just loves her mom so much that she's she's been the number one support i've been doing all the doctor stuff and my wife has been the one that's like been taking care of her the most so like just thank you for, for taking care of her. Yeah. May has wonderful parents. I know it's not easy while we go through every day, but, um, you know, thank you so much for sharing your story. I really appreciate you, James, and for your wife for your, uh, giving you the time to talk to us in the podcast. One thing to tell the families that are going through it is that everything is, is going to be okay you know all you could all you can do is you can only do so much you know you can only do so much for your kid um for us it's the first couple of years has been all about the medical you know about all about trying to get the medical situation down what does she need what do we need to do for her or and us understanding it now that it's been a couple of years she's four the we have all new challenges it still is very challenging but it's like the we're not closing the door in the medical. The medical still stuff is still going, but now it's her services. The services part of having an AGS kid is like a whole other chapter. That's still what we were going through now. It's uh, it's it's something to look forward to and something to be prepared for for any new parents is like any anyone special needs is because you have rare disease. You have a child with rare circumstances and and rare needs, different needs that now you got to go convince the school, the therapy, everything. You got to convince all these people now what's going on and what she needs. So that was our next, that's, that was the next chapter, which um, we don't have time to cover that, but um, maybe it, do, maybe it doesn't. A second podcast. Yeah. 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 We could do a podcast on services for sure. But this, this one is mostly about the medicine and there is a, there is a happy ending. Like I, I, I see it just getting better. And, and I appreciate all, all of your work and all of AGSAA's work for uh, trying to get some approval for this medicine.
would be wonderful. No, thank you. Thank you so much, James. And I would really love to have you another time to talk about the services, the challenges for our kids who um, have different disabilities, but in, you know, we still have to continue to advocate for them because it's really hard to get the accommodations that in 2023, which it should be easier, right? Mm -hmm. It should be easier. Um, and and I would definitely like to have you back on the podcast. With that said, James, thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate speaking to you and learning your story. It's, it's, it's hard to listen to them because it gives us as parents flashbacks, but it's very mm -hmm. important for others to listen to them because um, they, they need to know the details so they understand rare diseases a little bit better and understand AGS a little bit better so they can jump on board with us and help us um, in different ways. So once again, thank you so much for joining me and, um, and we'll be speaking soon and we'll be in touch. I appreciate you so much. Thanks for having me. I, I hope this can help someone. Yeah. It will. It will. <laughs>